Well, welcome everyone to our fifth hour of the 24 hours of Project-Based Learning Plus. I'm Nick Salmon, and I'm going to turn this over in a moment to Dr. Frank Locker, one of the other founders of the Alliance for Project-Based Learning Plus, as well as Gabriel Diago, who's on the call with us here. And uh, the basic introduction I'm doing is just to remind everyone that we're here to listen to the wonder of learning and learners. And um, everybody's microphones other than the speakers have been um, muted. And we're gonna use the chat box to really kind of stay on top of the questions. And it's been a, a nice a conversation going on in there. And so um, we'll, we'll make sure that those questions get out to our next set of um, uh, presenters. We are recording this and we intend to um, rebroadcast re them on, on our website, PBL Plus. And um, you, of course, can conceal your image at any time. We have um, the ability to share feedback through this link here uh, that will take you directly to one, and you can identify that you're participating in session number five. And um, we have um, panelists from uh, Morocco and from the US, and I'll let Frank uh, take it from here and I'll step away and stop sharing my screen. Okay, so Nick, we just learned something. When I mute, mute my, mute, yeah, right, I'm probably always mute. Uh, when I mute myself so that I'm not interfering, I cannot get back unmuted. So that just means you have to stay away for the whole 24 hours. Okay. Okay. I guess that technical point is 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 um, good enough for now. Um, I just want to add to Nick's uh, introduction uh, two things. Uh, one is that this is our first twenty four hours of PBL Plus, and we are already planning to do another one uh, in the in the fall semester, probably be early October, something like that. So stay tuned for that. Uh, the, the second is that we are doing uh, beta testing uh, on our platform, and if people want to pull that into their schools, just send Nick an email, or or I, I guess everybody has Nick's email. Um, so get get back to Nick, and um, we'll find you later <laughs> once that gets um, re reorganized again. Um, so with that, uh, add little ad for Toriel. Um, let, let me introduce Brian Sealstad from American Academy in Casablanca and Bill Olkers from Rhode Island. Um, I'll let them tell more about who they are and, and what, I was gonna say what schools they're with, but Bill's been like all over. So he'll have a long list. Um, and, and, and then they're, they're, they're both, we, we put them together and we're gonna wrap them together uh, because their PBL plus theme is, is about COVID-19 and what, what to do about that. Uh, so with that, um, let's start with Brian, if we could. Um, quick intro, you, your school, uh, and, and, then, and then Bill, and then we'll dump, jump into the kind of projects that you're doing. Nick, uh, Brian's still muted. Okay, good. I think you can hear me now. Yes, Great. yes, you're fine. Um, Frank, you don't want me to do the whole presentation now, or should I just do a brief introduction? Well, let's find out who you are, find out how sure. Bill, uh, Bill is. Um, uh, uh, and, 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 and then, and then um, I think we need to have just a little conversation uh, about your common interests, and then we'll get to your presentation. Does that sound Perfect. fair? Perfect. Yeah, okay. So uh, my name is Brian Seelstead. Uh, my formal title here at Ameri American Academy is the Dean of Global Engagement. And I wanna be clear, normally I'd be here with Dave Flashberger, who's the head of school at American Academy, but we just had the end of the quarter. So he is quite busy uh, checking all the, the uh, report cards and other types of things that need to happen so that students can get their grades. So he asked me to fill in, which works uh, quite nicely. 
my role, I'm, I'm new at the American Academy, and my, actually my main role is working to establish this American College Casablanca, which is going to be a new higher education, American Higher Education Institute in Casablanca. But my, um, I see my role as kind of trying to make learning exciting in and out of the classroom, but especially out of the classroom through global, anything related to global, let's say virtual exchange, study abroad, any kind of activities or experiences that can make um, learning just a little bit more real, a little bit more interesting for, for the students. So that's my main role at the, uh, at the academy and the college. Okay, great. Bill, can you uh, uh, jump in here? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, just fine. Yep. Okay, fine. Um, I taught uh, at Rhode Island College for 30 years, uh, and in the latter, portion of those years, I became very interested in project-based learning. In fact, worked with Frank, and we had a number of conferences at Providence College during that period. Um, so my interest today is uh, focusing on the opportunities that presenting by the pandemic. We think of it as a crisis, which it is, but I think there's also the, the chance to, to uh, make use of project-based learning in, in, in addressing that. And uh, I can speak more to that issue as we go forth, but that's, that's my background. And uh, I'm very interested in hearing what other people have to say about this issue. Mm -hmm. Okay, <laughs> it's certainly the most topical issue we have today. Uh, so let's jump back, let's just jump back to Brian. Um, can you put your toe in the water on this issue? Uh, and, and, and then we'll just get a quick response from Bill and then we'll get, let you launch uh, the things that your kids are doing. Sure. Um, my own, I mean, I've had a long interest in things, especially around things like service learning and other kinds of um, activities that get students out into the community. And I think this issue of the pandemic is actually brought a lot of interesting challenges across the world. But I think for us at the college, at the academy, and I'll say more about this, is that it, it, um, on the good side, project-based learning, we are, have it built into our curriculum for many, many years anyway. So it kind of made things a bit smoother, but it has highlighted that we need to do more to be ready for this kind of thing. We had some interesting debates about, you know, to what degree should we use video? To what degree should we lean into um, doing, um, you know, asynchronous projects and that's kind of where we started and now we're going more towards doing more synchronous video and so on but um, from a project-based learning side I think the good thing is that we you know none of the students and none of the faculty had much problems with with already doing that they already had it going in their classes it already was part of their curriculum it always already was part of their assessments so that was a good strength that we have because it's um it was already there and uh, but I think it has highlighted the not the, the, the lack of ability to get people together face to face has been a challenge. Um, students have struggled. We have had a number of students who kind of have, um, you know, I'm not say disappeared, but they've struggled with the transition to this offline asynchronous project based learning. They're great at it in school when they have the chance to be there face to face. It's very social, but but um, offline has brought in, you know, another level of things that we have to think through more carefully. Okay, my key takeaway is offline versus online or, 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 or asynchronous versus synchronous. So we'll come back to that uh, in a bit. Bill, you wanna jump in? Yes, um, I, I'd like to talk about possibilities. Um, I think it was Rod Emanuel, a former mayor of Chicago who said, we should never waste a crisis. And in this case, the crisis is the pandemic. And it struck me that project-based learning is ideally suited to deal with this issue. And I'll, I'll speak about how that might work. But uh, to me, the driving question in project-based learning is critical. And I think one possible driving question is to the students, how can we prepare for the next pandemic? Uh, the US has not done a very good job in, in, in its preparation, but I think the students can pick up the ball now and, and they can take on as their project that particular driving question. Um, there are so many aspects of that question that could be explored. For example, uh, the biology of the virus, uh, the vaccines, uh, the health issues, the economic versus the health, uh, 
and I think uh, this is rich for possibilities. Uh, and I can, I, can, I can talk a little later about uh, some of the uh, issues of collaboration. But for the moment, students in Rhode Island and most, most of uh, the eastern part of the country are dealing with uh, at-home learning, or what they call distant learning. And uh, they are at home now. This is an opportunity for them to be engaged, not just with their own studies, but with, with other students uh, through the internet in dealing with this particular issue. And I can speak a little bit more to that later. So, Bill, um, my big takeaway, uh, referencing traditional separation of curriculum areas, um, an outline that, that you're just presenting could wrap history uh, with science, with um, data analysis, uh, so maybe that's math, um, because you, if, if you're really going to, uh, my sense is if you really know, want to know how to prepare for the next one, you better learn from the last one. Um, and this one is the one we will have the most amount of, of, of uh, recent history and, and, and um, built in pain on. Um, so um, you can't avoid interdisciplinary as you're rolling out the concept you're talking about. Yeah. Yes, okay. absolutely. And yeah. I, th I think the other, the other aspect uh, that's involved here is the fact that uh, in the, the common core curriculum in the US, there's a big focus on what we call evidence. You've got to find evidence for what you're, what you're doing to back up your point. And in all those areas uh, across disciplines, there's an opportunity to say, where is the evidence? Uh, today in, in the US, we have a lot of political issues and one of the debates has to do, are oh, we going to rely on the evidence that the scientists present to us? And so I think students can be trained to look for not just uh, opinions, which are certainly rampant, but also uh, for data, uh, evidence to support their thinking. And I think that's, that's critical uh, in project-based learning. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, speaking of evidence, I think that um, I, I might ask whether uh, the topic might be expanded from how do we prepare for the next pandemic to how do we get through it, which is evolving on our national scene is a, a, a topic of great debate. Yes, uh, it certainly can be incorporated into uh, this particular unit. Um, it, it's 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 wide open for for how how to approach it. Um, and so, yes, that can be incorporated as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. All right, back to Brian. Uh, I guess uh, one of the things that come to my mind is that um, dealing with this pandemic has been, yes, it's a curricular challenge and there's a lot of things, but one of the things that's come to our mind is, is supporting students socio-emotionally in their learning has been really a challenge. Um, you know, I, I do teach at the, at the academy and we have counselors and we have a lot of, we have a good support in school, but you know, when we went off into this new sort of landscape, I think we all were kind of like sort of dazed by it. And, and it took a little while for us, I think, to catch up for our counselor to be, you know, not to say that she was being lax, but to be, you know, to become pro again, proactive about the student who hasn't logged in for two or three days or a week, like what's going on calling them and so on. So I guess that's something for me to, for us to kind of flag, like how do we do that deeper social emotional support that comes in a school in this type of thing? And it's not really a project-based learning issue per se, but um, you know, there's just students that are having behaviors that are odd, like, a, you know, students who normally is a great leader in group work in class and so on, and didn't participate at all in the project, projects that were required in my class throughout the, um, the, the third quarter. And I think that that's, that's definitely happened in talking to my colleagues, that there are these odd cases where some students have jumped in and really done a lot better because they can manage their time better. They're not distracted by other students who are annoying them and so on. They can focus on the projects and their learning and others who are who uh, normally are doing really well have um, been kind of shocked by this. So that's something that maybe we can bring up again is, is weaving, yes, we want learning and project base and so on, but the social emotional support has really been a, a key issue that I'm not sure that we're doing well here yet, but we're trying. 
Mm -hmm. Hey, Brian, you, you might call that leveling the playing field. Yeah. I mean, if, if the technology, if the need to go virtual disrupts the usual pecking order of who the kids are in the classroom, uh, I wonder whether, and maybe you've seen this, I wonder whether there are new stars arising. Yes, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I think that there are some that have ever risen, but I mean, there are some have also faded. So it's, it's an interesting, yeah. and then some have just disappeared completely. And those that were kind of fading already have completely disappeared. And so, and then we have to work hard as teachers and, and counselors to reach out to, to families and students and figure out what's going on. Is it a technical issue? Or is it, we have four siblings and one computer and how do we deal with that? And, you know, all of that stuff. Mm, yeah, real issues. Yeah. I, I, so do I understand, um, Brian, that when you needed to launch the, the, the virtual learning because of COVID-19, that this was really new experience for everybody? Uh, so, and, and families are scrambling to figure out how they get computer time and, and, and teachers are trying to figure out how they deliver their presentations and all of that. Is that the, the situation you're in? I would say it's a national issue. Yes. I mean, Morocco, you know, as you, as, as you know, Frank, like, yes, Morocco is not, is, is, is advanced in many ways. And the Academy is, is probably one of the more advanced schools out there. We do have a good LMS, uh, Google classroom, like all of that stuff. So we're definitely a far, a, a step above some institute, you know, a public school, public private, a public school where, you know, the, many of the kids are in the rural areas and so on. Like those, I have colleagues in those areas and they have really struggled to figure out, you know, how do I teach English? And they're doing interesting and creative things like creating WhatsApp groups and they're discussing, but it's really a challenge. I can say for us at the Academy that we should have been more prepared. I mean, we saw this COVID, we saw, we all saw coronavirus and this stuff coming on for at least probably uh, two weeks or a month and the kind of lockdowns that were happening. So I can say, I think we could have done more to, to jump into it and be proactive. Um, other institutions that I'm like, I, I was a professor at Al-Akhwan University, one of the better universities in Morocco, and they were quite proactive, you know, making decisions early that they would be conducting classes synchronously using Microsoft Teams and getting the students, but even they, and even they, you know, I think struggled a little bit with faculty who are resistant or students who are not quite ready or students that um, couldn't quite get into the system. But what I could say from the AAC perspective is that we were like in the middle we had a good curriculum with project-based learning and so on. I think the online aspect did surprise um, some. And we, I have also the perspective of parents, you know, some of the teachers have been, been good about getting things up, grading. We did a survey recently of all the students um, and their reactions to it. And some have said like, some teachers are, are putting their grades up and their stuff in an organized way, others are not. And I think that comes down to we could have done more, we could and should have done more maybe in the two weeks leading up to really prepare us for this moment. So Brian, but before we pull Bill in, could you, uh, and this is about this shift from face-to-face -to, -face to virtual, can you outline um, how projects are rolling out? Um, and one of the, and mm -hmm. cover this if you will. One of the interesting things that you had said already is that part of your students' experience is synchronous and part of it is asynchronous um, all on their own. How do you wrap those together? How do they know what, what to, what, you know, maybe they're all in charge, I don't know. Um, so this transfer from assumed face-to-face -to, -face to, oh, we gotta do it virtual. How does that impact project-based learning? I think it actually helped it to a degree because students, you know, the, the teachers had to go onto Google Classroom and there was, they already had Google Classroom for every class and to say, okay, we're not, we're definitely not meeting face to face over Zoom or anything like that from the regular times. So here are the things that we're doing today, this week, this quarter, and, you know, work on them at your own pace. So there's actually been a good side to it. I can see from my side, just as a teacher, that, you know, a lot of the students embraced it and were getting things done better, more with, um, you know, more consistently and so on. And I think that I've seen that from my colleagues. My wife, for example, teaches as well. And she said that, you know, she's been able to create really interesting kind of complex projects using all the available resources 
you know, there's just a lot of fun stuff that you can do online where you can take, um, you know, your, your lesson and make it into a puzzle, like a, like a literal puzzle. It's a picture that represents something and then students work together um, synchronously or asynchronously to put it all together and derive some lessons from it. She's made some fun like escape rooms with Google Forms. She has, um, you know, I myself have had students, you know, submitting videos or present presentations, small things where they communicate over Google Hangouts Meet and, and have um, kind of debates there. So there's been, I think, that actually has been strengthening. It's been the student, the students have been able to like collaborate um, on their own time and their own spaces in a good way. I think what faculty are missing and the students even in, the, in their feedback in that survey said, you know, they are missing the consistency of seeing each other daily talking. And then, and then the fact is that some teachers have not been as clear as they should have with or could be with their online instruction or as creative because a, defa a def default position is like for the teacher to say, okay, read uh, pages one to five and answer these five closed questions in Google Forms. That's, mm -hmm. I'd say some teachers have gone that direction, uh, which is not project-based at all. Yeah. So it's, um, it's been a mixed bag. And, and I think we, it, it points up for us as administrators and as the school, like, like we need to double down again on, on project-based learning, work hard at it and do more, keep doing more training so that when you go online, we can maintain the quality. Mm -hmm. Could you give us a scenario of what a successful one looks like right now? Um, I'm interested yeah. in teacher con synchronous contact time with with students, um, whether the students have deliverables by a certain date, uh, yeah. how they display their work, uh, and is it just to the teacher or is it to all of the other students? How do you right. how do you hold the community together? Right. Um, well, I can give an example from my own class, which might be decent. I have checked with some other faculty, but I think what I'm going to say is similar to what other people are doing. Now that we've kind of, we were a little bit strict about not doing a lot of synchronous video just because of worries about privacy and so on. But now we're, we have sort of gotten our Google Hangouts Meet to be turned on with our G Suite, which allows that to be like right on the Google Classroom main page. It's way more secure. It's more secure than Zoom. We know that some of the stuff is going on around Zoom, but it, it allows for it to be very nicely integrated with the class. So in my own case, we're reading, I took the opportunity in, our, in my freshman English class to read The Plague. I thought that was a pretty timely book <laughs> to do. Uh, we're supposed to read Of Mice and Men this quarter, but I thought, well, let's take the opportunity and read The Plague. So we're doing that. And then, so what students have to do by the end of the quarter in terms of a project is several different things. They're writing a, like a kind of a position paper that tracks COVID, um, you know, stuff and makes some recommendations about how the school could have responded better. They're also making like a, a website. These are individual things. They're making a website that tracks their own thing. But then the, the main kind of collaborative project based thing will be by the end of the semester, students will come or the, the end of the quarter. I'm kind of assuming that we're going to be on um, lockdown for the rest of the year, or at least there'll be no more face to face, face to face learning. If that changes, I'll be happy. But by the end of the quarter, we'll have these um, have a large, you know, regular class synchronously in Google in Google Hangouts Meet where the students will have, they already will have uploaded their videos where they present their arguments about how, you know, technologically or pedagogically AAC could have done better during the coronavirus. And then we'll have a debate online where the, each group will kind of have a few minutes to, to summarize their thing. And then we'll come down to a number of recommendations for the school that can be, can be used. And of course it draws a bit on the plague, the book and, you know, how here in the real world and in the plague, you know, the authorities dither about whether to go into quarantine and argue about the use of resources and, and it all ends up kind of being a bit of a disaster. So um, anyway, that's, that, that's what I'm doing. My wife, Sarah, for her English class is doing similar things, combining students creating text, uploading it, research projects, videos, and then bringing in, um, you know, daily or re weekly synchronous meetings to make sure at least everybody's on the same page and hopefully to also get people debating together about their their uh, their topics so if if there was a driving question that united the work of your students and and, and sarah's in her domain might it be something like 
how can we guide our school to do better next time? Exactly. Uh, and w would you have, ha okay, so that's a good driving question and every project needs a driving question and that's, that's gonna be a segue to, to Bill in a second. Um, would you have had that kind of focus if you were in the classroom doing face-to-face? -face? Would you have had more <clears throat> individual student work without the folding together and the need to create a, a comprehensive document that takes the learning from everybody and refines it and makes it ready for showtime to, to then send to the school? So I, I, it's a good question. I mean, as, as the virtual community, <laughs> is the virtual community stronger than the face-to-face -face community? Other than that, other than the, the kids like to rub shoulders with somebody their same age. Right. Um, it's a very interesting question. It might actually speak to this, you know, particular culture of our school. I think that, uh, you know, one of the things that we're a high school, I mean, we, we have a lot of kids and, and one of the challenges of it comes in like, you know, basic classroom management and students getting to class on time and so on. So, so one of the, the things that has strengthened the community is, is the fact that we don't, have to deal with quite amount. We don't have to deal with anymore. Like sitting in class, hey, stop doing this, start doing that. So, you know, it's more like now when we come together to do the, this work of presenting or discussing, like we are much more focused. You know, I mean, when you have the when I have the Google Hangout meets or when the students present their their videos or whatever, it's a it's a much more polished, focused product uh, and process as well. I mean because of some of the affordances here at the, in the online space, if the student is not present or not, or talking or acting strange, you can simply mute them or do other kinds of things. There are definitely some affordances here that I think have strengthened the community and made it a bit more serious. Um, um, uh, you know, and, you know, I guess the only thing that's lost is some of that, that exciting energy that comes from a high school classroom and some of the confusion that comes that students are, bouncing around in a classroom and coming to ask about, you know, is this what you really expect, uh, teacher? Is this what you want? And then the, the other thing that's lost is the power of the teacher to give that immediate feedback to say, hey, you, you know, this is not quite where you need to be going because, um, you know, that's the thing that I feel like is missing is that balance between the energy of the classroom, mo molding it in the right way towards the, the, pro the project at the end and then, um, yeah, so it's a really interesting question. I think we're all learning that this, this space has got some fun possibilities and others that are challenges. So let me underscore a couple of words you said, and I think they're key words. You said, it is a more polished, finished product. Mm -hmm. Well, that's pretty powerful. Because um, <laughs> don't we want that from all students? Don't we want them to know how to make? The polished finished products and it sounds like they're actually learning it because the technology tools are letting them see each other's opinions work refinements uh and, and they're all it, it's like the austin's butterfly uh video which which is a ron Berger video and one of my favorites ever um kids are kids are teaching kids without realizing that they're teaching uh yeah. and, and it's a it's a in a lot of ways, a, um, a kinder and gentler way of saying maybe the same things that you might have said as, as the teacher. Uh, am I, is that resonate? Is that sound? Yeah, I think so. And I saw Nick's there? question about learners providing feedback to each other rather than waiting for the educator. Yeah, I, that's actually, I think, a, a nice thing. I mean, as a teacher, what's also interesting in this space is that you don't see that process directly. I mean, you're not observing a group of students who are working together. They're doing it now offline. They're calling each other. They're having their own Zoom or WhatsApp calls or whatever that they're doing. I guess you could capture that in some ways within a LMS, but but um, you know, there's probably not. I mean, that's that's students don't want to make everything that they're talking about visible. So so it's actually kind of exciting to see the product. Although I can say I miss seeing the process a little bit more directly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So uh, related to that, and this is a traditional question, this is a, 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 a school management question. How are you going to assess the different contributions of your different students as they're all um, online, or, or maybe you're not? 
Um, I mean, I, I can speak partly from management, but also from my own teaching, you know, I mean, there, you know, one of the challenges is, is um, again, balancing, especially in group work in this project based group work for during student, you know, individual work, you know, maybe I've kind of myself as a teacher leaned into that a little bit more where, you know, it's individual papers or daily questions on the plague or whatever, there's maybe a little bit more there than I would have for my classroom experience. But, but um, I think what, what I've tried to do, and I think what the school has tried to do as well is, you know, to have assignments and projects in which the voices of all the students who are involved are very, are clearly there. So in my case, when, if students are going to put together a video or presentation, like I literally need to hear their voices and all of the audio video products that they put in, or if we're going to come together in a Google classroom or Google hangout meet, I need to like see and hear those, those, um, those voices. Mm -hmm. I have had a few, I mean, this happens with all projects, you know, especially writing projects that can be challenging. I've been experimenting more with how to see in Google classroom, sorry, in a, in a Google doc, you know, individual student contributions, cause you can see with the versions, it gets a little bit complicated, but, um, I think that is a, is a, is a challenging thing because you do have the, the strong, the, the, the students who are, have been doing it for a while to write the paper for everybody and submit it and, and so on when you want to have a, a really strong project. So, and group work. My, Sarah, my wife and other teachers I've talked to have wrestled with this as well because they know that some students are carrying the water for a lot of others, but they're also sometimes surprised to see, especially when they have assignments where students are required to show their, to have their voices present or be present on video or other things that the students are really stepping up. So it's a good. Uh, yeah, that, I mean, that, that whole reality of students folding their work together and some stealing the show. Is there a Google Doc setting that lets tra changes be tracked and acknowledge yeah. who the change makers are? Yeah, there are, yeah, and, it, and it's just a matter, it's just really from the teacher side or yeah how um you know how to create how to do that in a fair way how to assess that in a fair way you know because it's you know it comes down a lot you know rubrics how can how to capture that in rubrics or other kinds of things because students are very especially i don't know students everywhere but i think students especially here are very attuned to the rules of the game and you want to have to make that very clear with with um something rubrics assessments anything the design and i think that it that that it can also be so complicated for teachers to assess that, that they might just say, you know what, I'm just going to grade this whole paper. Everybody gets the same grade and, and which is not yeah. ideal either. Right. Yeah. Um, or, or if you did have to do it that way, you might do it as small focus groups. So yeah. three kids together or five, if you've got a class of 25, you might get 50, you might get five different documents produced. Um, yeah. And if you as the teacher can manage who is on each one of those subgroups, uh, mm -hmm. you might be able to match uh, abilities, dynamics, control, and, and all those things. Just a suggestion. Um, exactly. So Brian, you've lobbed a lot of things at us. This is really good. Uh, I, I mean, and, and, and it sounds like, yes, you're in development, but you're also on top of it. Um, so can we segue to Bill and maybe Absolutely. he can pick up some of the things yeah. you've thrown on the table here. I know assessment's a big deal in the USA. Um, the, his reference earlier to 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 Common Core. Um, uh, Bill, what what about all those things? Uh, let me pick up with uh, a slightly different uh, orientation before we get into assessment. Uh, we okay, talked fine. about the challenges of of a project based learning in this situation. But I think there are so many opportunities. Let me give an example. In Rhode Island, each each day the governor goes on goes on television, talks about uh, the state of affairs in terms of the pandemic. But she also references uh, what's happening with distant learning in the schools. And so far, she's been fairly positive about what's been going on. Now, coming more locally to the town in which I live, in which Frank is well aware, a new middle school opened just this past year. And its focus is project-based learning. And I addressed this issue to both the curriculum director as well as the state commissioner and said, look at the possibilities here. The students are, are already online and they're dealing with a lot of class assignments. Suppose as one of those assignments, which as Frank indicated earlier, can incorporate a lot of disciplines 
they were to address the issue of the pandemic. And it could be whether how we prepare for the next one or how we deal with the, the, the present one, uh, that students not only work uh, from their own uh, desktop on this project, but they, because of the internet communication process, they also connect with other students, not just in their own district, in their own classroom, but also in their own state and in other states beyond them and actually in the world. Because unlike other uh, issues, this is a, a, a universal one. Every, virtually every student in the world, to my knowledge, is impacted by the, by the pandemic. And so they have, a, they have a, a commonality there, which I think we can take advantage of. So as a, as a vision, I would see that students around the world now can uh, work together, they can study together, and they can make presentations that combine the, their efforts, uh, uh, you know, from, from various perspectives. These, these presentations obviously are, are speeches, multimedia presentations, uh, artistic and theatrical uh, presentations, written publications, but because we have the connection to the internet, the possibility exists for students to join together in addressing this issue. So it isn't just a student in a classroom or a classroom, but the students around the world who said, look at the pr different perspectives we bring to this particular <laughs> where we stand. And I think this is the possibility. Obviously there are challenges to making this possible, uh, but I think it's rich in opportunity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, by the way, I, I, I love it that the governor acknowledges education. <laughs> um, that's, that, that's pretty rare. Yeah, yeah. Um, so could you, um, so those are those possibilities. Um, uh, and I'm asking this question because I, 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 get the, I get this all the time. Um, how do we isolate the performance of individual students so we can complete our duty of, 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 of assessing their work? And, and, and I know that goes beyond this COVID-19 topic, it, it is, right. but it is particularly a, a, a virtual PBL versus face-to-face -face PBL. I think a student has to, uh, in, a, in a group presentation, has to argue for their contribution, uh, explicitly saying, this is what I did to make this presentation uh, possible. Here's, here's what, here's, here's was my role. Here in a self-evaluation too, here's how successful I was at accomplishing that. So it's a couple of things. Here's what I did. Here's uh, the, the positive aspects of what I did. And here are the things I learned from that experience. So part of the evaluation is uh, done by the, by the students themselves, in which they argue the case uh, for why they deserve to be uh, graded uh, in, in a certain way. Um, mm -hmm. The burden is on Bill, them, in other words, to a certain extent. Yeah. Bill, that wasn't an answer I was expecting, but I think it's beautiful. So uh, what, it, I mean, it, it would be then that students will take the time to be reflective about their work. Yep. That's uh, right. And, and we rarely do that in traditional school. We always move on to the next thing. And we, we assume, oh, the teacher knows how to do this assessment. Um, and, and maybe that works. I suspect it doesn't work to the extent that we wish it would or, or to the accuracy uh, that we would hope it had, but but the notion of um, of kids being reflective, they and and and, and if if you had a metric for it, um, or uh, you, you know that that will be instilled in them uh, to to then learn, um, you know what's important for their own learning. Um, I, I wonder whether, uh, and I'll make another reference to Austin's butterfly. Um, I wonder whether they could take that idea. And if four kids are working on a team and they each do their own individual assessments, then they have to share their assessments with the other students and see whether those students agree. With, so so if, if, if one student has said, yeah, I took command of the group and, and that's what I, that's my value. Uh, and the other students could, 
could then say, well, wait a minute, that got in the way um, or something like that. Uh, so, so not only individual um, uh, personal reflective uh, assessments really, uh, but then just like you're talking about folding together the concepts of how to avoid COVID-19 in our school next time, it actually folds together uh, personal assessments. Does that work? Yeah. Yes, I think after we could add a fourth element to that, and that is, okay, we, everyone's looked at each other's evaluations, self-evaluations of themselves, and there's a kind of concluding statement by the student, each individual student said, yes, I think uh, uh, this is how our group actually did work. I, I agree uh, that we participated well, or, or maybe we didn't. And, and I think that can be the kind of concluding statement uh, to their self-evaluation. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, okay, that sounds really good. Um, so why isn't that done in traditional face-to-face -face education? Well, one of the issues, of course, is that project-based learning isn't being done in traditional education either. <laughs> and and, and that's, uh, that's, the, that's the problem. Uh, project-based learning makes, makes these opportunities possible. Uh, in, in traditional stuff where you simply uh, learn the stuff, you take a test on it, and pass it in, you go on to the next topic. Uh, obviously, we all know project-based learning has a di very different orientation, so it lends itself to doing, doing things differently, including, including the evaluation of students, student groups. Okay, touche, Bill. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. Let's, let's lob this back uh, to, 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 to Brian. Uh, and then, uh, by the way, uh, we have about uh, 12 minutes uh, before we have to, we, we get to cut off because it's time to change the, 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 uh, the venue. So Brian, how you want to pick up on that stuff? Uh, well, I guess what I would say, I mean, again, I would talk from the institutional perspective, their project-based learning, again, has been built into our school, but of course we have, it's a balance. I mean, it's, there are times where we have to do with traditional learning. I was in the last session somewhere where somebody mentioned the AP test. We do have AP exams and I think we really struggle um, kind of, uh, and this maybe even goes with the Common Core and the other kinds of curriculums, the IB. We just became an IB World School, which IB is quite nicely aligned or more aligned, I think, with project-based learning than AP is. So, you know, we, we um, are constantly, I think, struggling with that idea within our students, within our parents. Um, our parents, you know, in the local Moroccan context, you know, there is a strong drive in regular, I'll well, say regular other Moroccan public schools towards kind of road member traditional styles of learning, you know, there is um, this pressure of testing with the baccalaureate exam. So, I mean, I think we are struggling in, in an ideological context that does not always support this kind of project-based learning. And even within our own school, you know, there are different opinions about what constitutes quality learning and so on. Although I do think that we are highly supported um, in the, in the school by the American, just the name like American, I think that that destabilizes some things. I mean, Amer American can mean a lot of things to a lot of people, but I think in the Moroccan context, American does uh, index like kind of creativity, innovation, and other things that are generally kind of positive and work well with project-based learning. Um, and now that we're, you know, diving more into the IB and other kind of curriculums that take us, I think, in a good direction, I hope we can balance that kind of like rigor and learning and, and so on with the projects because it's, um, it's, it's, uh, it's necessary, but I, and I know that there's a way through it, but it takes a, a, li a large kind of a consensus from, from a lot of people to, to make it work. But I think at, at the school, alhamdulillah at our school, that consensus is, is very, is, is more or less widely shared. Mm -hmm. We don't mm -hmm. have big fights in our school about like whether it's the right way it's it's agreed this is the way that we should be teaching and learning um, it's just sometimes the quality individual quality individual practice and ways to extend it you know um, we've had some really exciting things that that have happened in recent years around horizontal alignment across classes we had last year for example I wasn't here but I mean this is things I've heard about you know the the PE art history and French 
teachers all working together on a big project around like like dance and movement and language and francophone countries exploring like colonial leg legacies in Africa in dance and other places so and they did this you know this was all explored individually in classes with their own projects in a like a vertical kind of awesome. alignment and then um, how are you gonna do that what's important well I, I suspect and I hope that one thing that we will have here is just a bigger discussion. I think that on the policy side, we need to write, you know, better policies into our, into our um, documents about how to do this quickly. Like what are the expectations when we have to go into this kind of pandemic um, situation? So that's, that's dealing with the next one, I guess. And, and I think we could have done a lot better. I mean, I think that we could have had policies in place that would have encouraged and practices and training. And I think that this, I suspect next August, you know, when it's new faculty or even going, we're going to have like more intense sessions about how to use our LMS with all of its features, you know, don't, instead of kind of being fearful that, okay, if students might do bad things with the video functions or the chat functions, let's, so let's just shut them off. Like, no, we're going to keep them on. We're going to learn how to use them. That's one on the policy. I think the second thing though is, I think that students are really going to miss, there will be students and teachers that are going to be like, we need to keep this um, online asynchronous um, aspect really alive. And, and I think that students will, you know, especially those who have been marg kind of marginalized in the school cu culture uh, for personality reasons or whatever, they, are, they will want to have opportunities to learn asynchronously and they will insist, and I hope that we keep this, insist that the projects that they can do can be done online in a really exciting way and fun. Um, so that, and I think that teachers will be, a, and I hope that this, I think this, I know that this has spurred a lot of creativity from the teachers to, to mix the online offline world and really make fun activities. And I mean, I know that like my wife is really great at, and, and we can do more to share these things, like really great at finding those fun little websites where you can build a puzzle and put it together. And it can be, those can be an activity that, that happens in a, you know, as, as a warm up, or it can be extended to a much longer uh, project. So I don't know, I guess the, if I had to summarize those things, we need to improve policies, we need to have better training, we need to keep the creativity and keep the openness that that came from this so that, you know, all the students can access the learning and prove and show their, their competence um, through projects mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. meaning. Okay, and then an extension of that question is when you do get back together and you have your faculty meetings or whatever, however you communicate, um, is this gonna be a topic of discussion and uh, will you invite students to come in and talk to the faculty about how doing projects was enhanced by technology or maybe um, things that really didn't work from the students' point of view? Yeah. Um, and, and, I'm, well, and, and actually, and, and as a sidebar to that is that that's one of those empowerments of teenagers uh, to be the experts in the room for yeah. even a short period of time. And that's something that traditional educators don't right. think about. I mean, I can't speak, I, I mean, all I can say is that, that we've already you know, started to assess the student experience through these various surveys. And I think there will be a deep attention to that. I mean, I know my, I'll definitely be pushing for it. And you know, I'm on the executive board and we'll be pushing for this to, to occur. And I think, and, my, and the only deal I think risk that it wouldn't happen is just we get caught up in the you know trying to wrap things up and then next year and then it's like you forget there was this pin pandemic that we have to kind of process and work through but i uh you know i so i i i i think that everybody is going to be very very um eager to process this experience and students and and students voices will be part of that process and and we have to work hard to make sure it's formally part of the process and they you know, we have the student council and the parents council and like I think everybody will be engaged but it takes intentionality. Maybe, Brian, maybe one of the, once you know when you're starting school, maybe one of the last projects your students should work on is okay, what do we tell the teachers? Yeah. What was I mean, this I, like? that's what I'm, I'm plan, as I kind of plan in the, my specific class, but I think that's something that needs to be a, a broader 
a broader goal. There's a decent chance that we'll be back in school at the after Ramadan is over, but we don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I hope, I, I think ideally it'd be wonderful if we can, you know, come back to school and then take the last three, four weeks of school. Yes. To complete the curricular objectives and so on, but really, you know, settle into some community meetings and discussions about what can we learn from this and make just to be stronger after all, after all. Yep. Yeah. 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 Well, it sounds like a plan, huh? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Bill, you want to jump in? Um, and, 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 and maybe pull some big umbrella thinking out of this? Well, I would hope in, as we go forward that, for example, during this uh, pandemic situation, students will have opportunities to, to connect with each other, for example, from, from Rhode Island to Morocco, and that those connections will be continued uh, on other projects long after the pandemic is over, we hope. And so we, we, uh, we, we broaden our horizons so students will have uh, the uh, chance to hear from voices from different places. And, and I think that would be one um, product of this initial effort to get to an international focus in education. Um, and I, th I think that would make it all worthwhile. That's brilliant. So let me just restate that. So a next project that students in different countries could be doing together is hmm. how do we best prepare to for the next pandemic and what do we do once we're in it? And, 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 and what, what, as you say, I mean, it's like, wow, I never thought of that. But as you say that, I'm thinking, I'll bet that the experience that the Moroccan students have because of the way their national government is has, you know, led this pro the response is a very different experience than the USA kids would have because of the way our government has 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 led the response or not led the, the response. Um, and what a I mean, <laughs> you, it, it may be that we thought the topic was a, a, a integrating English, uh, and I mean I'm sorry, in, in, integrating uh, tech, um, uh, sciences and integrating history, but it's also integrating civics. Yes. And, uh, in, in a real, um, uh, in a real, um, in the moment uh, manner. And, and that's pr pretty amazing to be able to pull that off. Mm. Yes. Frank, that's a great spot to wrap, wrap on. I, this was a, in spite of the Zoom bombing, that was a wonderful session. <laughs> the three of, three of you really had a wonderful well, conversation. I, I, I'm slightly like uh, pleased to have had this like now, I guess, another universal Zoom experience. I, <laughs> it wasn't I mean, pleasant in a sense, but it's like, wow, I guess this really is, this really happens. Yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry that it happened. Um, and I, we all learned of how difficult it is to respond to such a thing, but yeah. Um, yeah, but so but on the other hand, you guys were, you guys were great. Well, uh, we, and uh, I do you have each other's contact info so that no, I, so that you don't have to wait till October? Yeah, no, we do, we do now. Yeah. yeah, we've been connected through the um through the through Nick just through setting all this up. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah, yeah. and I'm okay. sure at the end all, all of this, all the participants and everybody will be there. Probably will be some follow up with emails and participants and so on. Yep. Yeah, and actually, to, to extend Bill's last idea, um, instead of linking just a school in Rhode Island with a school in Morocco, maybe we get five continents mm -hmm. um, and, mm. and have them all address the same question. And, yes. and, 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 and the, the biggest challenge might be finding the time uh, to, to have a synchronous conversation. Mm. Uh, <laughs> You know, so, so I, I, and I would, you know what, I'll give you guys a challenge. Okay. We are going to do another 24 hours of PBL plus, and it's going to be early October. I give you guys the challenge to take that idea, link two schools together, Rhode Island and, and Casablanca, but then grab a few more. And among the presenters we have here today, you, you will, have plenty to choose from and see what magic you can make. And then 
we'll, 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 we'll give you six hours in October <laughs> <laughs> to talk Great. about it. Uh, but, but, and the reason I say six hours, is not just because this is the kind of thinking we need to have for all students if we are serious about making global citizens. But mm. if you can link to six other countries, we will have six experts all at the top, or, you know, all, all online at the same time. Mm -hmm. And we will hear their stories and how they're different. And, and if we've had their students with them, uh, we, will get, we, will, we will learn what the learning was from those students about being on an intensive platform with other passionate students to all try to solve the same question. Yes, that's right. That and the beauty, so and the beauty is the pandemic is a universal issue. So they, unlike other issues that are local or even regional, this one is across the, across the board. And I think that's the advantage of dealing with this particular question. Yep. Great. All right, we're going to okay, pause we gotta, we gotta here. Cut. <laughs> and so uh, we're going to bring up uh, Angelica here in a moment. So thank you so much. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for that. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, David. Hey, thank you. Thank you. I really thank enjoyed you talking with you. Thank you. Likewise. Good. Talk good. to you both soon. Okay. I'm going to.